Hello and welcome to the eOrganic webinar on Researcher and Farmer Innovation to Increase Nitrogen Cycling on Organic Farms by Louise Jackson and Tim Bowles of the University of California, Davis. My name is Alice Formiga and I'm the webinar coordinator for eOrganic. eOrganic is the organic agriculture community of practice with eExtension. You can find all of our published articles, videos, and our many upcoming and recorded webinars on organic farming and research topics on our website at extension.org slash organic underscore production. Before we begin, I'd like to briefly introduce our speakers. Louise Jackson is a professor and extension specialist in the Department of Land, Air, and Water Resources at the University of California, Davis. She has a long-term interest in participatory research to understand soil and root ecology. Tim Bowles is a PhD candidate in the same department. He has developed expertise in a diverse set of methods to assess plant-soil interactions on farms with a variety of different management strategies and landscape conditions. So now I'm going to hand things over to our first speaker, Louise Jackson. Hey, um, I'm... Um going to be talking about a project that was funded by the USDA Organic Research and Education Initiative and the title is on the cover page. So the, the premise of this project was something that we all know quite well and that's that organically farmed crops are quite muted to nitrogen limitations. One reason is that we rely on organic organic matter inputs and microbial activity rather than synthetic fertilizers. And because of this, it's difficult to match the timing of crop demand with the release of soil nitrogen. There's also another problem, and that's that environmental end losses can occur during mismatch periods, say right after a cover crop is incorporated and no crop roots are present. So in this study, we hypothesized that there were three typical scenarios on organic farms. One is inadequate nitrogen availability and crop nitrogen limitation. Another um, two fell in the category of adequate nitrogen availability that meets crop demand, but in one case, higher nitrogen inputs, soil inorganic pools, and potential loss occurs. And in the other hypothesized scenario, we see a situation with high organic matter inputs, rapid turnover by the soil biota, and low soil inorganic end pools. So this study is focused on looking to see if those hypotheses actually come um, to, into in, to being. So another objective was to look at nitrogen testing that could be used on organic farms. Most of the current soil testing is used um, for conventional farms with synthetic nitrogen fertilizer. And we need to really do some um, innovation in thinking about these testing approaches. We need to look at a wide range of growers' practices and experiences and also try out new scientific methods and techniques. So this is the same slide, just putting it in bit better context of exactly what we're going to be talking about today. First of all, we're going to be talking about tomatoes. Tomatoes in California, a major crop in California. And the typical hypothesis scenarios that I just described, we're get, giving them some names. These names are just shortcuts, but they help us throughout the presentation. So the first one would be end deficiency for crops, and the second two would be adequate nitrogen availability that might be nitrogen saturated versus a tightly coupled end cycle as the third scenario. Well, it's really hard to talk about any of this including testing approaches without having you see a little bit more detail on the nitrogen cycle. And so I'm just going to go through this really quickly. You probably know it well, but let's just start out with the plant. The plant takes up ammonium and nitrate to meet its nitrogen needs. It doesn't really require any other forms of N. Where do they get that ammonium and nitrate? Well, in an organic system, it's a lot from soil organic matter. Soil organic matter is complex, some of it's old and others new and fresh. During 
um, different kinds of physical and biological transformations. It's transform into monomers like big molecules that then microbes can break down. And microbes break down in that um, soil organic matter to release ammonium that can get then converted to nitrate. What's important is ammonium and nitrate are also needed by microbes, shown by the brown arrow. So it's sometimes, especially like right after a high carbon and nitrogen cover crop, microbes might actually be competing with plants for this ammonium and nitrate. We're looking for situations where microbes are releasing or mineralizing that end without um, really stiff competition. We'd like to see a situation where the ammonium and nitrate pools are low, but there's rapid production through this cycle and uptake by plants. One reason is that we would really like to avoid high nitrate pools in the soil. That's because it can be leached, it can be lost by denitrification, and both of those processes are um, detrimental to the environment. So what we're going to be talking about is some ways that we can look for indicators that might be indicative of that highly um, t tightly um, coupled nitrogen um, cycling process. Here's a background slide of how we got interested in this project. This is a field um, trial at the UC Davis campus with organic and conventional plots side by side. They're managed pretty simplistically, but they showed some really interesting differences between conventional and organic. Throughout the season, these are the dates um, stacked here um, on these histograms here. We see that there's no difference in ammonium between organic and conventional, no difference in nitrate. The plants, the tomatoes, were um, adequately supplied with nitrogen, but we saw much higher potentially mineralizable N, two to three times higher in the organic, and also higher for this assay as well. So what that made us think is there's higher nitrogen availability in the organic without having higher nitrogen pools, increasing, um, decreasing the potential for nitrogen losses. And that's how with this data, we got um, started on a project that was much more farmer-oriented. So one of the things I want to do now is set up a um, question for you. If you're a farmer, what we'd really like to know is do you test nitrogen in your organic crops or soil? Yes or no? And um, you'll have about 20 seconds to respond to this question. Alice, I've lost my screen with the um, slides on it. Unmuted. You'll get it back in just a second. Okay. okay we worry. also <laughs> have another question for you, and that's this. If you do test for nitrogen in plants and soil, how helpful is it for your management decisions? Is it very helpful? Is it moderately helpful? Or is it weakly helpful? So if you can um, answer those, um, we'll get the results back shortly. And what I want to go on now with is the design of the project that we're going to be talking about today. First of all, as I said before, it builds on previous research. Not only the research on the research station um, plot that I described with higher um, activity but not higher ammonium and nitrate pools in organic, but another um, OREI project in which we looked at nitrogen cycling on a single farm, the fates of nitrogen, and um, the effects of water management on nitrogen cycling on this organic farm. And in that study, we also showed that we could have very low nitrate pools and adequate nitrogen nutrition in the tomatoes and low susceptibility of the system for nitrogen loss. Then a third project that also fits into this new framework of the study we're going to be telling you about is one on looking at roots of tomatoes, giving them a pulse of ammonium and nitrate and looking at the gene expression that is going on of different enzymes in those roots. It's a pretty sophisticated technique, but what it showed was that 
the gene expression was really sensitive Muted. to and nitrate in the roots, and so it gives a good idea of plant nitrogen uptake. So the study that we're going to be following on with then is talking about new testing approaches for soil nitrogen availability and plant uptake to help organic farmers in this context. And doing it on on-farm studies across the landscape on a number of different farms with different growers. And then trying to um, essentially identify ways to supply nitrogen to the plant without the potential for end loss. Unmuted. So before I get um, go further um, or get into the poll, I want to say some thank yous. First of all, to all the growers who collaborated on this project, their names are here. They were really helpful and gave us a lot of muted and access to the farm advisors in our county. To scientific collaborators, Verona Acosta Martinez, who did the enzyme work on this project, and John Yoder, who helped with the, the gene expression work. To members of the Jackson Lab, especially um, Andrew Marginot, who worked um, on the, the sampling and the soils. Especially to our funding source, the OREI Initiative, and to an NSF graduate um, fellowship that supported Tim Bowles, who's going to be taking over now. So I haven't seen the results of the poll yet. Um, here they are. Um, so about half the people um, test their nitrogen and how many find it um, really useful. So um, more people find it moderately or not useful to very useful. So the fact that a fair number of people don't test and it's not all that useful is the kind of information that we really need to know to make it more useful to all of you. And hopefully during this webinar, you'll be able to see some of the things that we have in mind. Now I want to point out that these things are not off the shelf, but we're ready to get them useful for future um, farmers. And that's where um, we're going to head next is into what those, um, those testing and approaches are. I'll turn it over to Tim now. Okay, thanks, Louise. Um, let's see if we can. I don't seem, there we go. Um, well, first things first, I'd like to uh, introduce you to Yellow County, California, uh, where this project took place in order to provide some context for the farms that we'll be talking about more in depth over the course of the presentation. Yellow County is about 90 minutes northeast of the San Francisco Bay Area in the Central Valley of California. And here we have a Mediterranean climate with cool, wet winters and hot, dry summers. And as you can see from this satellite photo, Yellow County is predominantly rural and it's dominated by irrigated, intensive agriculture. Organic agriculture in Yellow County has quite a long history. In 2008, there were 76 certified organic farms, and some of these farms had been using organic practices for more than 30 years, well before the establishment of our national standards. There's a mix of what I'm calling all organic and mixed organic and conventional farms, by which I mean that some farms have all of their land certified as organic, and other farms maintain a mix of both certified organic and conventional fields. The production in Yellow County is pretty high value. Uh, tomatoes are a big crop, which of course we'll be talking about in this presentation. And there are also a lot of mixed vegetables and fruits and nuts. And as you can see on these graphs on the right, the value of uh, organic production in Yellow County has gone up dramatically in the past 20 years to almost $30 million. And this kind of mirrors the national trends. Over the past 10 years, the certified acreage has maintained relatively stable, but what's very interesting is that the value per acre seems to have gone up dramatically. And while there are likely a number of reasons for this, one that we feel is important is just the amount of learning and experimentation that, have, that has gone on on farmers' fields uh, in this county. And that was one of our main uh, objectives, it was to, to see all of this innovation and, 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 and measure it and, and, and look at it in more depth. And so there's quite a range of growers, like I mentioned, from fresh market growers, uh, 
oriented towards uh, farmers markets and, and CSAs um, to growers who are, are growing for a more of a large scale processing market. As we see here, this is a picture of a tomato harvester harvesting Roma type tomatoes uh, in late summer here in Yellow County. And these farms are using a wide array of practices. Here we see a picture of a winter vetch cover crop uh, just a week or two away from incorporation in, in the spring. Uh, while as, whereas other farms uh, aren't using uh, cover crops and just letting winter annual weeds grow, but are applying a source of compost annually, maybe a municipal green waste uh, or an animal product. And so while there's a lot of uh, variability in the markets and the farming practices used, organic tomatoes are actually something that a lot of farms here have in common. Uh, Organic tomatoes, in particular Roma type tomatoes, are widely grown. Uh, they're a high value crop for both fresh and processing markets. And so, so they sort of span the range of organic growers here. And interestingly, at the UC Davis Long Term Cropping Systems trial that Louise mentioned earlier, there were some early struggles to achieve adequate organic yields in tomatoes. And this was mainly attributed to nitrogen limitations. So the overall framework for this project really starts with how grower decisions about their agroecosystem management affects the plant, soil, and microbial interactions that take place across this heterogeneous landscape. That is, this landscape that has different soil types, different levels of soil organic matter, and then how these interactions uh, produce things like nitrogen availability and nitrogen retention, the building and accrual of soil organic matter all of which go into producing reliable yields over time that further influence grower decisions in the future. And so our primary research and engagement objectives for this project were first to work with growers to understand how their different strategies and landscape context affect nutrient cycling, soil organic matter and crop yields, and then to identify the potential for these new measures and analyses to serve as part of a set of integrative indicators of plant soil nitrogen cycling for the future. And so in today's presentation, we'll really be focusing on the right-hand side of this schematic. And our main questions today are first, are there farms that produce well with tight plant soil nitrogen cycling? And if so, is this related to soil carbon in any way? Or is it due to a specific type of input? Or is it possible with different management regimes? And then secondly, what methods could farmers use to assess tight nitrogen cycling in the future? And so the first step in this monitoring study was to identify the fields that we'd be measuring. And one challenge was to ensure that the fields we chose were representative of the entire landscape. And so to address this challenge, we used a GIS, or Geographic Information Systems approach, and compiled a database that included all sorts of information on organic tomato production in this area. We characterized the variability of this production area in terms of the different soil types, different distance to natural vegetation, and other variables. And this allowed us to quantify the full range of variability in organic tomato production in this landscape and ensure that we picked a representative sample. And then to identify the particular fields that had organic tomato production in 2011, we used the Certified California Organic Farmer Database to identify most of the certified organic farms growing tomatoes in Yellow County, and we contacted these growers to assess their interest in participating. And so we ended up with eight growers who were managing 13 fields in Yellow County that participated in the study, and they included four fresh market and four processing vegetable growers. The management practices used across these eight different farms were, were quite different. Uh, you'll see that I have the, the farms listed from A to H uh, over here on the left. Uh, three out of the eight farms used a winter cover crop. In all cases, it was vetch. Three out of the eight used a uh, source of animal manure, mostly poultry. And half used a composted municipal green waste. Most farms also applied some sort of secondary input, uh, such as seabird guano or a soluble product like a fish emulsion. And all of the fresh market growers used drip irrigation. Uh, while the processing growers used furrow irrigation, with one exception. 
there were pretty similar soil types across the 13 fields. And you'll see here now that I've labeled the fields from 1 to 13, uh, as opposed to grouping them by the farm. And all of these soils are, are alluvial soils that are highly rated for agricultural production. The measured texture in the top 15 centimeters, or about the top 6 inches, uh, was very similar, all silt loams and loams. And the pH was between 6 and 7 on most of the fields. And so overall, there was relatively little variation in texture and pH. And so our measurements on these 13 fields uh, focused first on indicators of nitrogen availability. And you may be familiar with some of these measurements. They're typically measured in agricultural systems. Uh, for instance, soil ammonium and nitrate, or the plant available forms of nitrogen. We also looked at soil potentially mineralizable nitrogen, uh, which is an estimate of the amount of organic nitrogen that can be easily mineralized by microbes, or in other words, that can be easily made available to plants. We looked at different properties of soil organic matter, ranging from total carbon and nitrogen to dissolved organic carbon and permanganate oxidizable carbon. These are different uh, pools of soil organic matter that microbes can uh, more or less easily uh, mineralize and chew up. Uh, we also looked at tomato yield and different uh, indicators of tomato nutrient status, such as petiole nitrate. We also looked more in depth at soil microbial activity, uh, including soil microbial biomass and enzyme activities for carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur cycling. And finally, we took an in-depth look at plant root activity by measuring the expression levels of different genes involved in nitrogen uptake. And I'll go more in depth, in particular, into these last two categories as we uh, move on through the presentation. So in, in order to identify the three scenarios that we hypothesized existed, we used multiple variables, uh, including indicators of yield, uh, soil and plant nitrogen. And first, I'll examine these measurements individually on each farm. And then we'll use a statistical technique uh, called principal components analysis, which will help us visualize all of the variables in farms together and give us a really in-depth and comprehensive view of what's going on on these 13 fields. And so let's first take a look at uh, the soil organic matter and inorganic nitrogen across the farms. On the left, we see soil carbon and nitrogen. And there was a three-fold range of soil carbon across these different fields. And you'll see that I've ordered them in terms of soil carbon. On the other hand, soil ammonium, which is on the right top graph, uh, it was relatively low um, and not that variable. But there was a, a large amount of variability in soil nitrate, uh, so much, in fact, that I had to uh, sort of compress the, the y-axis here so that we could see it all. And this ranged uh, all the way from less than 1 all the way up to 45 micrograms of nitrogen per gram of soil. Crop productivity was generally pretty good. Um, you'll see in this top graph here that uh, I'm showing fruit yield in terms of in tons per hectare. And the green line is showing the average 2011 California production that included both conventional and organic all across the state of California. The average in 2011 was 107 tons per hectare. And you'll see that nine of the 13 fields are close to the overall California average. In the next graph down, we're showing shoot nitrogen. And the orange line shows uh, what would be considered nitrogen deficient based on published values, anything less than 2.5% nitrogen. And 11 out of the 13 fields are above this critical shoot nitrogen level. And finally, I'm showing pedigal nitrate in the bottom graph with the orange line showing uh, anything that would be considered nitrogen deficient based on this measurement, anything less than 8,000 ppms for tomatoes. And so interestingly, eight of the 13 fields actually show nitrogen deficiency based on this petiole nitrate relationship. It's important to point out, though, that this uh, petiole nitrate relationship was uh, developed in conventional systems. Um, but here in these organic farms, we show that there's a pretty poor relationship between petiole nitrate and fruit yield. And so just to summarize a little bit, overall we had good yields, adequate nitrogen, but petiole nitrate was not a particularly good indicator on these organic farms. And so let's zoom in on three of these fields and, uh, and, and look for these, these scenarios uh, that, that we hypothesized existed. 
So on field one uh, is an example of a, a nitrogen deficiency scenario. Uh, the soil had the lowest soil carbon and nitrogen, very low soil nitrate. The plants also had low nitrogen and pretty low yields. Field four, on the other hand, could be considered a, a nitrogen saturated case. The soil had pretty low carbon and nitrogen, but very high soil nitrate. The plants also had pl high plant nitrogen, and the yields were pretty high. And finally, in field 12, we have uh, higher soil carbon and nitrogen, some of the highest found in the study, and low soil nitrate. But the plants had, had pretty good uh, nitrogen, and the yields uh, were also high. And so looking at each field like this on a case-by-case -case basis is a good starting point. But we can also consider all of the variables and fields together in order to gain a more comprehensive understanding of what's happening across these 13 fields. And we'll be doing this uh, using PCA, like I mentioned earlier. And I'm going to step through this really slowly uh, because it's a very information-rich uh, way of looking at, at what's going on. And so PCA is a technique that condenses our variables into new summary variables based on how our variables are associated with one another. And these new summary variables are the two main axes of this graph that I'm going to layer on data. And so we have one variable on the x-axis called PC1, which is associated with higher crop yield and nitrogen availability as we move from left to right. And on the y-axis, we have another variable, PC2, that's associated with lower carbon and nitrogen, but higher inorganic nitrogen, or ammonium and nitrate, as we move from bottom to top. And so we can put on the actual variables that went into this analysis, the variables that we measured. And so you'll see that all of these variables are on the right-hand side of the graph, or along the positive values of the x-axis. And so hence, they all reflect higher crop yield and nitrogen availability. On the y-axis, you'll see they're spread out uh, through the, from the bottom to the top. And we see things like soil carbon and nitrogen uh, on the, the bottom of the y-axis, but soil ammonium and nitrate uh, towards the top of the y-axis. And so the variables that are very close together are ones that are very strongly correlated with each other. For instance, down here, we see soil carbon and nitrogen almost right on top of each other. Uh, and, they're, they're, and that indeed is the case. They're very highly correlated. And so now we can put on the samples. Each of these dots represents one sample that we took in the field. There were six samples for each of the 13 fields, or 78 samples total. And samples falling toward the direction of a measured variable tend to have higher values of that variable. For instance, these two samples way up here at the top falling close to soil ammonium and nitrate do indeed have very high values of soil ammonium and nitrate, but low values of variables related to soil organic matter. And finally, we can put the fields on here. And so again, there were 13 fields. And these different ellipses are centered on the six field samples. And the smaller the ellipse, the more similar each sample was from a given field. And so now we can start to see some of our, uh, our nitrogen cycling scenarios. Over here, we find fields one and two all the way over here on the left with low values along that x-axis. And that reflects the, the lowest soil organic matter, uh, a nitrogen deficient crop, and, and lower yields. Then we look up here, high on the y-axis, but with positive values on the x-axis. And we see an example of nitrogen saturated fields, four and seven. These fields had higher ammonium and nitrate pools, high petiole nitrate, and good yields. And finally, we can look down. Oops, there we go. Finally, we can look down here to fields 11 and 13 and find an example of tightly coupled plant soil nitrogen cycling uh, with low values along this y axis. Again, these had the highest soil organic matter, low soil nitrate, but good yields. And so just to summarize this broadly speaking, what this illustrates are differing pathways from nitrogen deficiency to good yields. So in this, this red arrow, we're moving from left to right. And we see that we're moving from, from, from lower to higher yields, but we go up 
towards this higher concentrations of soil and organic nitrogen, the potential for nitrogen loss. But this green arrow is moving from lower to higher yields uh, down towards the soil organic matter, towards a tightly coupled scenario. And so it's really important to point out that these pathways are really continuums and this most fields are sort of intermediate somewhere along this pathway. And so now really the question is what's responsible uh, for this tightly coupled nitrogen cycling scenario with, that has good yields. And so the first key message that we have here is that working organic farms can indeed produce well with tight nitrogen cycling. And that this tight nitrogen cycling is associated both with soil uh, carbon and nitrogen as well as management. We saw that tight nitrogen cycling is associated with higher carbon and nitrogen, but nitrogen deficiency is associated with very low soil organic matter. But of course, management is playing a big role too. In the short term, for instance, within a, a growing uh, season, using really highly labile nitrogen inputs like seabird guano contributed to higher soil nitrate and uh, the potential for nitrogen saturation, especially when soil organic matter was lower. And in the longer term, over the course of many growing seasons, uh, using a combination of organic matter inputs from uh, composted materials to soluble materials with uh, more readily available nitrogen for plants may be the best options for, for building soil organic matter, achieving tight nitrogen cycling and good yields. And so the next part of the presentation will focus uh, a lot more in depth on uh, how uh, a really in, uh, comprehensive understanding of soil microbial and plant root activity could be used to support adaptive management um, and learning in the future through more informative indicators. So what is happening in the soil? What are these microbes doing? Well, just like the bacteria in your digestive tract, soil microbes release different enzymes to break down organic matter, which is their food, into smaller pieces so they can more easily ingest them. And this is the rate limiting step in liberating nitrogen for plants to use. Microbes use specific enzymes to acquire carbon, which is their energy, as well as nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur which are the nutrients that they need. And so our collaborator at the USDA ARS, Veronica Acosta Martinez, measured the activity of nine different soil enzymes. And I'm showing two representative enzymes here. On the left, we have beta-glucosidase, which is involved in carbon cycling or energy acquisition. And on the right, we have uh, aspartase, which is involved in nitrogen cycling. And we see that these soil enzymes are basically showing opposing trends. The carbon cycling enzymes show greater activity in the nitrogen saturated fields, whereas the nitrogen cycling enzymes are showing greater activity in the tightly coupled nitrogen cycling fields. And this really helps us understand what's going on because these high rates of, uh, these high activities of, of nitrogen cycling enzymes are supporting higher rates of nitrogen cycling and turnover which means that plants can acquire nitrogen even when, plant, even when nitrogen pools, ammonium and nitrate, are not building up. So what's happening in the roots? How are the roots perceiving this, this, this complex nitrogen cycling environment? Well, interestingly, plant roots are very sensitive to nitrogen availability in their local soil environment. And different genes encode the root machinery or the different root enzymes that enable plants to take up and use soil ammonium and nitrate. And by measuring how much these genes are turned on or how much they're expressed can give us a plant's eye view of all of this complexity of soil nitrogen cycling. So let me just step you through the process here a little bit. We'll start up here. Uh, this is a picture uh, taken in the field um, uh, in 2011. We took uh, soil samples in the top 15 minute centimeters that included tomato roots, and I extracted those roots in the field and froze them within just a couple of minutes of taking them out of the ground. Then we used laboratory techniques uh, to measure the expression levels of 10 different plant root genes involved in uh, nitrogen cycling. And by considering the activities, the, the, the enzyme, uh, the, the, the expression levels of all of these different genes uh, gave us a lot of insight into the complexity of plant soil nitrogen cycling. 
And I'm just going to focus on a part of that here in this next slide. So we identified one gene, uh, GTS1, that was particularly sensitive. And the enzyme encoded by GTS1 is involved in the incorporation of both soil ammonium and nitrate into plant biomass. So let's take a look at these different graphs. On the y-axis of all of these graphs is the relative expression level of GTS1. And then on the top, we have PMN, or potentially mineralizable nitrogen, as well as microbial biomass carbon. We can see here that there's a highly significant linear positive relationship between the expression of G this GTS1 gene and these two microbial bioassays that are good indicators of nitrogen availability. Now in these bottom two graphs, we have soil ammonium and soil nitrate. And we see here that there is actually no relationship at all between GTS1 and ammonium, and only a very weak relationship between GTS1 and nitrate. So to kind of summarize, we can say that GTS1 expression is better associated with microbial activity than with ammonium and nitrate pools. And so thus, from the plant's point of view, these microbial bioassays are indicating nitrogen availability well in this group of fields. And so now I'm going to turn it back over uh, to Luis, who's going to help us uh, kind of put all of this together. So I want to give a summary of one of the uh, main outcomes Unmuted um, project. First of all, by going across the landscape and working with many growers with different types of management and trying out a whole lot of different types of plant and soil measurements, the work that Tim has done has identified these three different scenarios that we hypothesized were um, present, with some fields uh, more on the end efficient side, some more um, with adequate um, plant growth, but high nitrogen um, pools in the soil, and then some with tightly coupled nitrogen cycling. And that's the most desirable. Because here we found out that it was able to, to produce high yields and it means there's less nitrate available for those environmentally detrimental end losses of denitrification and leaching. It retains more nitrogen in the soil. Looking at the soil microbiology, the tightly coupled nitrogen cycling Muted. occurred when there was higher soil carbon contents a really active microbial biomass and higher um, levels of enzymes in the soil that release nitrogen. So there is a consistent explanation for why these soils with higher soil organic matter do supply adequate nitrogen to the plant. Finally, with the gene expression work, we could show that the root nitrogen uptake could be high in the farms with tightly coupled nitrogen cycling. The root nitrogen metabolism genes showed a m more positive response to soil microbial biomass assays than to inorganic N. And the reason must be is that the si soil microbes are rapidly turning over nitrogen and making lots of ammonium and nitrate available to the plant even though it doesn't build up in the soil. So this is our last slide in which we try to take this work a bit further and to think about larger contexts than just our tomato systems in Yellow County. I think we could all agree on several multiple goals. High yields, building soil organic matter, and retaining nitrogen. These are valuable not just for agricultural production, but for the environment, less um, reactive end that has these environmentally detrimental consequences and it's also a way to build carbon, to store carbon. Everyone also recognizes these are extremely challenging goals to expect or find all in one farm. Well, our study is showing that organic is an organic, an excellent model for showing how these goals can be achieved. With the tightly coupled nitrogen cycling scenario, 
we're seeing all of these. What does it mean for farmers? Well, one thing that we'd like to ask you to think about is which of these scenarios do you think is occurring on your farm? Do you think that you are um, on a trajectory towards one of these more than another? And if you are, if you're interested in nitrogen um, testing, you're going to have to measure more than one thing. For example, low soil nitrate could mean that either your crop is N deficient or that you have tightly coupled nitrogen cycling. So if you got measure of potentially mineralizable N or total leaf nitrogen, you could help differentiate between those scenarios. As Tim pointed out, there's a lot of variation amongst our fields and that adaptive management with testing could help you move along a path towards tighter nitrogen cycling. We also want to address this for extension workers. How might this type of approach be useful to you? Well, our study showed that working with a number of different um, farms and farmers was able to show attributes that were consistent with this scenario of tight nitrogen cycling, just because we had way more possibilities than occurs on a research station trial. What we um, were able to do was compile a set of indicators that could um, be indicative of these multiple goals. Several indicators are necessary and they're probably going to vary among regions and among soil types and among crops. Some of these are readily available, but we really do, do need more indicators such as the enzymes and the root gene expression. While those aren't available right now, they could be things that we work towards in the future with the more streamlining of some of these approaches with new methods. It's important that people know what their neighbors are doing on similar soils, crops, and marketing constraints. And what we're trying to do, and might be useful in other contexts too, is develop a community awareness for the types of options and adaptive management pathways that could push people towards tighter nitrogen cycling that benefits their production and these other goals as well. And hopefully that's a way that we can gather support so that we have a better testing options and testing facilities in our agricultural areas that go beyond just the types of tests that are useful for conventional agriculture. So that's the end of our, um, our talk. Unmuted. Thank you so much for listening. And please let us know if you have any questions. Thank you very much, Louise. Um, and Tim, we're about to begin our question and answer session. How did you measure potentially mineralizable nitrogen? I think it's a question for Tim. Yeah. Um, so this, uh, so we measure this. It's a it's a laboratory uh, incubation, which means that we um, we take the soil and uh, uh, it's an, what's called an anaerobic incubation. So we um, uh, saturate it with with water and then um, we incubate it at a certain temperature for one week. And then we measure the amount of ammonium that was in that soil uh, at the beginning and then at the end of that incubation period. And the difference uh, between uh, uh, the beginning and the end is what we define as, as potentially mineralizable nitrogen. Um, so this tends to be really highly correlated with um, uh, this uh, or indicative of a, of a very like labile pool of soil organic matter, something that's going to be easily mineralized uh, by microbes. Okay, um, another question. Does high B glucoside concentration in saturated nitrogen soils imply that soil carbon is being depleted? That, um, I can speak on this for just a second. Uh, yes, that, that enzyme uh, beta glucosidase, um, that's, that's something that we're, we're working on now is, is and I, I think that it could be indicative that um, that microbes are processing carbon uh, more readily in, in those fields. Um, the pattern of carbon enzymes, other in addition to that one beta glucosidase enzyme, was 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 really similar. Meaning um, that with all of that extra nitrogen around, we saw that nitrate concentrations tended to be pretty high in those fields. With all of that extra nitrogen around, um, 
microbes become what we call carbon limited, or they're more limited by their energy sources, which is carbon, uh, than by their nutrients, which is nitrogen. So to, uh, um, to, to rectify that situation, car in, uh, microbes tend to go after carbon more. And so yes, it, it could mean that carbon cycling is, is that carbon mineralization is happening uh, more readily in those fields and, uh, and depleting uh, uh, organic matter as well as organic matter. Okay, um, so which fertility practices on the farm studies produce the most desirable results toward the three goals? Do you want to uh, make Okay, um, I'll, I, I can take that one on. Okay. Um, I think that the um, use of multiple different types of inputs of organic matter and even in some cases of soluble um, nitrogen fertilizers is the one that is best for multiple goals. It's a way to achieve high, higher yields through the, the tightly coupled end cycling. It's more likely to build soil organic matter. Having a, a combination of harder to degrade and easier to degrade soil organic matter inputs, say like yard waste compost would be harder to degrade plus a fresh cover crop would be easier to degrade um, seems to be important for building soil organic mat uh, matter and that in turn can increase the microbial activity in ways that at least temporarily immobilizes some of the nitrogen and then allows it to be released again to the plant so the turnover is high. Okay, um, let's see. Um, were you able to determine specifically how well um, nitrogen release from vetch cover crop was matched with tomato crop demand? I don't think we've gotten to that point yet. Um, the next phase of the data analysis is to look at more detail of, on the management practices at each farm. So this analysis was looking more across the farms and there'll be a next phase going on over the next couple of months of sort of dissecting out the effects of management practices one by one. Okay, um, here's a question about what was the level of farmer involvement in this project? Um, were the farmers pleased with the outcome and do they plan on using the same approach this coming season? Well, the level of farmer involvement was really high. We, um, the, all these farmers were really interested in cooperating. They gave us um, very detailed management information. They made it possible for us to get out and sample frequently um, and um, with good timing with their, their irrigation and such. Um, we are planning to work more with them to distribute all the results. Um, over the next couple of months as the management data becomes um, more um, understandable on each of their farms. It's probably not going to be possible for them to use the testing methods that they use, th that we used this year because a lot of them were fairly um, difficult to do and aren't done by our soil testing facilities. But I think that a number of them have expressed a lot of interest in better nitrogen testing as a result of this. And just to, just to add a little bit on there, um, I mean, I, uh, I'm, we met uh, with each of these growers individually on a number of occasions um, during that growing season and subsequently we've had some sort of preliminary discussions about the results um, on, on their farms. Um, and uh, just from my observation, it seems like um, you know they were they were very interested. I mean, they they don't get to see this level of, of detail um, on their uh, of, of measurements on their farms uh, very often. Um, okay. Um, another question. So, in the case where you have a test that indicates that you're not nitrogen deficient, but you have tightly coupled nitrogen cycling, what actions? should um, should you take? Well, it, I think first of all, what Tim pointed out is many of the farms were on a trajectory towards one of these sort of typical hypothesized scenarios. So 
what you would like to know is can you improve that? Are there times of the year or maybe you're in a crop rotation, um, some um, seasonal issue that decouples, makes a mismatch between nitrogen cycling. And um, those can be done by um, field experiments that you might set up. Sometimes those take a couple of years to do. You might find on some soils on your farm that the tests are um, more um, along this trajectory than others. But it really is a matter of trying out a number of different fields and management um, options and keeping on with the testing. One of the other issues is that we don't have enough of this landscape approach in how we do this. We can also learn from what other people are doing. And I think that's one of the ways that Extension can become more involved, is sharing some of the results that come out from different farms where people have, different, have done different types of experiments. Okay. Um, did you find any relationships between the years of organic management and tomato yields? Or how about between nitrogen application rates and tomato yields? That's a great question. Um, we, uh, there was quite a range of uh, time and organic uh, in this study, um, all the way from, uh, I think, the, the field with the fewest years was about two years, and then we had one that had been uh, close to 30 years. Um, and uh, we, we didn't actually find uh, much of a relationship between, directly between yield and uh, and years on organic. Um, we have to keep in mind that there's just so much going on here. Um, there's a weak um, relationship between soil carbon and years in organic, but we also have to keep in mind that all these farms were starting out on different soil types and, and um, slightly different, I mean, the textures were very similar, but slightly different textures. Uh, they may have had different land use histories. Uh, so I think it's that we found any relationship is actually pretty interesting given were how different all the different starting points of these different fields, um, and I think the the other question was about uh, nitrogen um, application rates, um, maybe in this particular growing season. Um, and actually, the um, if you tallied up um, just by uh, just looking at at total nitrogen and all of these different organic inputs. Um, the, the total amount of nitrogen applied on each of these farms was relatively similar. Um, it was, uh, I think, around uh, about 150 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare. Um, and, uh, and so because there wasn't a whole lot of variation there, we also didn't find um, much of a, a, a relationship. Um, I don't know if you want to add anything or clarify anything, Louise. But. No, I think that, that you gave a really good summary there, and we also have to remember that some of these farms are going through very different types of crops and crop rotations. Right, right. We absolutely. had um, fresh market and processing growers, and the fresh market would have been much more diversified systems. So that is also another legacy effect that is not really easy to discern because you don't always have the past histories in that detail. Okay. Um, plant nutrient uptake tends to follow an S-shaped or logistic curve through the season with very little uptake early and then rapid uptake and then leveling off later. How do you think an organic farmer can manage around this changing plant demand throughout the season? I can try to answer that. Well, um, one thing that um, we find with um, our um, horticultural crops, tomatoes, peppers, and such, is that it is pretty hard to manage these crops for high yields without some sort of supplementary nitrogen. If only cover crop or um, manure is applied early in the season, the crop can run out. One of the ways that we can get around it here is through drip irrigation. Why? Well, first of all, 
there's um, less um, water applied to initially get the crop going. There's less chance for leaching and denitrification early from those inputs. And another thing is it makes it more possible to apply some soluble nutrients. So um, that S-shaped um, curve is really um, helped out by drip irrigation in these horticultural crops. Um, the other thing that um, we um, have to count on is that through um, at least a period of the buildup of soil organic carbon and nitrogen, that um, long-term supply of different forms of organic matter um, is um, giving a more um, consistent source of um, degradable material for microbes. So that um, not only the combination of different kinds of organic um, inputs, but um, a past history of doing so keeps the microbial activity up and running through that peak um, period of nutrient demand. Okay, here's a question about whether um, plants take up more complex forms of nitrogen. <clears throat> there is evidence that some plants do rely on um, organic um, and, say, um, methyl ammonium. Um, in tomatoes years ago, we did some experiments on that and found that tomatoes used it very little, slight uptake but mainly when given a choice, relied on ammonium and nitrate. The ecology of plants that rely on more complex end sources, organic metals are often in natural ecosystems where there's less ammonium and nitrate availability overall. One thing that um, we need to understand more about is how root exudates and mycorrhizae um, do affect the breakdown of some of these monomers right in the rhizosphere. And right close to the root is there's some plant effect going on so that those um, monomers, there's most more complex organic molecules, are more readily broken down or taken up as ammonium and nitrate. But that was beyond the scope of this study. Um, are there any faster or cheaper methods of measuring or accurately proxying PMN? <clears throat> well, one that we tried in that very first slide I presented, uh, Martin Berger tried um, hot KCL, so taking a KCL um, solution, potassium chloride, um, and um, using it to essentially um, quickly um, break apart organic matter and release the ammonium. And that correlated well with potentially mineralizable N. Uh, there's a whole lot of different assays out there for this labio form of mineralizable N. Um, we use this one because it's tried and true. And another important point about it is it, um, it um, is looking at the accumulation of ammonium. Um, sometimes it's hard when you measure nitrate to be able to make sure you collected everything. It's susceptible to loss in our soil um, assays as well as in the field. Another um, couple of possibilities that are also being being looked at, not by our group, but um, but other researchers are uh, one well, well one thing that we measured permanganate oxidizable carbon um, and also a, a short term respiration. Um, incubation uh, um, uh, assay and uh, so uh, folks are looking at those for, for organic systems as well and they are a, a little quicker uh, than, um, than, that, than that PMN uh, measurement. Okay, um, you're suggesting I think, um, says the questioner, that higher soil organic matter is associated with higher microbial activity. How much do you think microbes are depending on soil organic matter compared to simple compounds released very recently from roots? That's a really interesting question. I, um, well, we can't answer it based on the study. Personally, from my experience, I think that the soil organic matter um, is a really important source of mineralizable and from 
for plants. And the reason gets back to that um, S curve. The roots themselves may not be initially exploring much of the soil. And so the actual volume that they can um, affect right around the rhizosphere is pretty small. But throughout the soil, um, the bulk soil uh, that this root system starts to um, grow into, microbial activity is going on. So while the rhizosphere is important, for sure more important than we probably realize, especially in organic systems, I think that soil organic matter set of processes and turnover is more important for the total um, end release that it provides during that peak plant growth period. Okay, um, this goes back to PMN testing again. Um, would you recommend um, testing potentially mineralizable nitrogen with an aerobic inc incubation? Well, there, uh, there are a lot of different ways to that people measure PMN. Uh, one, like aerobic incubations are definitely one of those. They tend to actually take much longer uh, than this shorter term anaerobic incubation. It's one of the reasons that we use actually this this week long anaerobic incubation as opposed to an aerobic incubation, um, which can go on for weeks and if not months. Um, but they do actually correlate extremely well uh, this the anaerobic and the and the aerobic uh, incubations. Okay, um, you may have already shown this in a slide, but what were the um, soil organic matter percentages across the farms? I saw pH and soil type, but not um, organic matter. So the um, the, soil, uh, the soil carbon um, was, there was a three-fold range. Uh, in the lowest field, it was uh, about 0.7%, all the way up to a little over 2%. Um, and soil nitrogen mirrored that very closely when by that I mean that the carbon to nitrogen ratio didn't change much across these fields and it was about nine or between eight and a half and nine and a half I think. Um, and so that was that was the range from about 0.7 all the way up to 2% carbon that is. Okay, thank you. Um, what was the average, oh yeah, okay, I had a similar question here. What was the average of the soil organic matter of the um, used in the study? Do you have that average figure? Uh, yeah, I, I, mean, I have it open on my computer here. It was um, uh, 1.3% 1. Uh, 1. was the average, but it was a pretty nice, um, if you recall that uh, the graph, um, it, it, was a, it was a pretty uh, uh, good range. Uh, I mean, and, and the evenly spaced, that is, um, but the average was 1.3%. Okay. Um, have you looked at the length of time the farms were managed organically and the total organic carbon? Yeah. Um, I meant, uh, as, I meant, as I mentioned just a minute ago, the, um, the farms ranged in, in time and organic from uh, two to uh, about 26 years. Um, and if we did a regression between time and soil carbon um, and included uh, information on texture as well, uh, we would, there is a statistically significant positive relationship between time and organic and soil carbon. Um, now it's a relatively uh, weak relationship, um, but that doesn't mean, uh, you know, we know from all, of, from, from, uh, farm, from, from experiments that uh, soil carbon does tend to increase with time, but since all of these fields are uh, had different land use histories and, and slightly different textures, it's not surprising that we're not seeing a really strong relationship. But uh, in fact, I think it's pretty interesting that we're seeing a relationship at all. Um, so yes, there, there is a relationship between time and organic and total soil carbon. Hmm. Um, how applicable would you, you expect your research um, to be in other climates like colder or wetter climates and other soil types like high organic matter soils? Um, what would you expect to be similar and what would you expect to be different? Um, that's a good question that we're still, um, we haven't probably thought enough about because we're so focused on this. I think that, that it's likely that there might be some different scenarios that occur in different types of soils and different types of regions. It's likely that there may be soil tests that are more important in certain soils. 
Um, there's other options for looking at some of these things. Um, maybe characterization of different forms of soil organic matter in the soil would be useful. But we're, um, it's, it's probably likely in many areas that people, at least initially, are dealing with N deficiency as they make the transition to organic. It may take different amounts of time to get to a tightly, um, tightly coupled plant soil nitrogen um, cycling scenario. So I think that's one of the reasons why this um, landscape approach is a good one, is that it really helps make the information more pertinent to the challenges that people are facing in different crops and in different regions. Um, here's a question about whether you've developed guidelines on how to move toward tighter cycling in terms of um, which cover crops used or when they should be terminated, etc. Well, that aspect, as I mentioned before, of dissecting out which management practices and how to use the different management practices on different farms is the next stage of the data analysis. What I will say of other work that we've done here in California is that the um, timing of a cover crop is really important in that um, we can, um, in very wet years, for example, reach situations where we have a fairly high carbon to nitrogen cover crop that really interferes with nutrient uptake by the crop early in the season. So some of the guidelines that we would recommend would have to do not only with the species, but when it's planted and how long it's in the ground as far as cover crops. And also the different types of management with furrow versus strip irrigation. Um, and um, I'm sure there's other things too related to the crop that was in the ground prior to the cover crop. So essentially here in California we have a possibility for growing plants year-round. And that is probably the main set of guidelines that we're going to be working with here, and that could be really different in parts of the country where that just simply is impossible during the winter. I guess I'd also just add real quick to also think about timing of the other organic matter inputs, uh, such as, you know, your the composted manure or composted uh, uh, green waste. Um, and you know, from uh, some farmers apply in, in the fall uh, as they're making the beds for the next spring. Um, you know, it, there's uh, always the, especially if there's not a cover crop grown, there's um, always the potential for losing some of that nitrogen over the winter. And here, when we get our, the most of our, our rains, um, so thinking about the timing of not just the cover crop incorporation, but of other organic matter uh, inputs. Okay, here's a question about whether water pH was looked at in the study and whether any of the farms manipulated their water pH during their growing season. Hmm. No, we didn't measure that. And I haven't heard growers talking about that here. Okay. Um, do any of the long-term organic plots have a history of biosolids addition before the organic food law was passed in 1999? Well, that was another one that we did not hear anything about. We do have pretty detailed management histories, and we didn't hear about that one. No, I, yeah, no, no one mentioned uh, biosolids, um, and I don't believe they've ever they were ever applied to the cropping system experiment here either. Okay. Um, will you pre be presenting the next phase, farmer practice analysis, with relation to tight nitrogen cycling in the future? And if so, m what might be the timing of that? Oh uh, well, uh, what do you think, Tim? <laughs> Are we up for another one? We'd love to hear you again. Um, well, this has been yeah. a fun experience. Yeah, I think we could be up for another one. Um, uh, yeah, I think uh, we're we're really um, I'm digging into this data analysis. As you might imagine, this is uh, there's a lot of uh, a lot of data to to uh, to look at. Um, but I'm really digging into it uh, over this summer, um, and uh, I'd like to have this this uh, as as well as possible. Uh, you know, over the next uh, few months. 
Okay. Um, do you think there's an association between the amount of tillage and the PON and tightly coupled nitrogen cycling scenarios? That is something that we've worked on in the past um, here, but not on farm. We worked on it at the research station that we talked about it earlier. The reason is, is for these crops, small seeded crop, um, tomatoes, um, high propensity of weeds on organic systems. There's very few people who measure, who manage um, tomatoes um, no-till or even low-till. There are some people who use minimum tillage because they have the drip irrigation in place buried deep. But nothing like people in the Midwest would think about with no tillage. What we did find on these soils was even a year without tillage and using um, a complex rotation with um, a bean crop and um, Sudan grass crop, we did see an immediate increase in microbial biomass in the soil. We saw um, a more complex soil food web um, in terms of nematodes. And um, we saw that the um, carbon was accumulating in the soil in a very short time. So these soils would be very amenable to that if it could fit into the cropping system. Okay, we have time for a couple more questions. Um, you talked a lot about nitrogen testing. Um, relatively speaking, how informative are our phosphorus tests compared to our nitrogen tests? Well, that hasn't really been part of this study, so um, I don't feel confident about answering that. Okay. Um, did you have different reactions from conventional and organic growers? Well, there weren't any conventional growers in this project. So, um, I... Well, in this, there were, I guess... Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah. There, there were, um, like I, I mentioned, what I'm calling all organic versus mixed. Um, mm -hmm. You know, growers that maintain both conventional and, and organic acreage. Um, and I guess just uh, I'll interpret maybe what you mean by reactions. I think every, um, you know, everybody seemed very interested, and everybody, uh, you know, there was no differentiation in terms of I think the the level of um, interest and in, and in, in, in managing these systems better and retaining nitrogen and, and figuring out how to um, how to understand all this complexity a little better. And I think that in our other work with conventional growers that they would be interested in these kinds of tests too. That the kind of tests that we're doing here could be really valuable on conventional systems that go more towards um, organic matter accumulation. Okay, this is our final question before we end here. Um, suppose you take a pot of soil from a field and grow a few plants in, in it in a greenhouse prior to planting. Could that give you a helpful proxy for PMN? I I guess so. I mean, some people have also talked about having some sort of sentinel plants in the field that might be particularly sensitive um, to nutrient deficiencies and using them as indicators. The problem is, is that what you have in the soil at the time you plant in a greenhouse might not be what the plants in the field are seeing because you may just have incorporated a cover crop and so that, that timing, once again, getting back to that question about the S-shaped curve um, and what's in the soil at the initiation of plant growth could have, could have a big effect on whether or not you judge your soil to be deficient or not. Okay, well, we're running out of time. Uh, we managed to answer all the questions. Um, I'd like to thank you very much for all your questions and mention once again that you can find um, this um, recording within the coming week, along with our many other recorded presentations on organic farming topics at the link on your screen.